<clears throat> Ambassador Haas, thank you very much. And thank you for the enormous amount of time you've spent over the many years, including much of last year, uh, in trying to cobble together a meaningful and responsive uh, approach that will really take Northern Ireland uh, forward and, and make progress. You know, in, in her testimony in the third panel, Julia Hall from uh, Amnesty International points out that the current mechanisms, while they have worked for some, uh, have failed to conduct prompt, thorough, and effective investigations in an independent and impartial manner in line with the U.K.'s international human rights commitments. And she points out that uh, repeated investigative failures across the mechanisms have crucially, um, I think she means critically, or maybe crucially, undermined confidence and trust in their ability to deliver the truth about the past. And secondly, points out uh, that the mandates, uh, the, there's been a piecemeal approach to investigations in, adopted in Northern Ireland. And it would appear that both uh, Baroness Alone and you uh, are both calling for a new, much more effective mechanism. And again, I think many lawmakers and policymakers in this town um, have moved on to other things, all the reason why this hearing is being, uh, has been convened. Uh, could you speak to those criticisms of the current mechanisms, while well-meaning, unwittingly have not produced the, the um, uh, record of results that one would have hoped for? And then this whole idea of unfinished business. I would hope that some of our friends in the media today or even tomorrow when they write their articles uh, and publish their stories would talk about the unfinished business. You have it in your report. I have read it. It is excellent. It makes so many very fine and I think uh, very uh, uh, forward thinking um, and, and very credible recommendations, yet most people don't even know about it. Well, thank you, sir, for what you said. Just to be clear on one thing, it is not my report or our report. Good point. It is a report that grew out of this process and our attempt to, to bridge the political divides, yet still put forward a, a set of ideas that, if adopted, we believe would leave Northern Ireland uh, better off, considerably uh, better off. On your, your, your question, the current approaches, uh, they are multiple. Essentially, you have four existing approaches. Uh, they are time consuming. The fact that we are still talking about unfinished investigations tells you that. They are, in some cases, extraordinarily expensive. In some cases, they are quite distracting because the groups like the current police service have everyday tasks to carry out, yet they are still also obligated to deal with the heavy burden uh, of the uh, past. Plus, despite all this, despite all this effort and investment, some of the current efforts do not enjoy the kind of broad legitimacy that one needs if they are effectively to deal with the past. So it's not a criticism about, about effort. It's not a criticism of motives. It's simply a, an observation, if you will, about results. And the reason, therefore, we came up with the idea of creating a new and independent uh, historical uh, investigations unit with, with investigative powers was to try to deal with this, uh, the fact that the current approaches were time consuming, a bit of a distraction, and lack legitimacy because they were seen as under the police service uh, rather than distant from them. So that is why we have come up uh, with this pro approach, and we believe it is the best way of threading the needle. Uh, it is not, as the Baron has suggested, what, we, uh, what, we've, what has been put forward in this report under the police service. That is simply incorrect. It is also independent. Now, in a democracy, and we understand this from our own system, indeed, I use the analogy at times in the talks, we have things like the Supreme Court, we have the Federal Reserve, we have independent institutions. But in a democracy, you still need accountability. You can't have free-floating institutions that don't have a degree of tether or of accountability, and therefore, we, there has to be an appointments process. There has to be some oversight process in a democracy. And what we try to do was come up with the best way we knew in consultation with the five parties of threading that needle, of coming up with something that was as independent as could possibly be construed or constructed, yet at the same time had adequate oversight and accountability. And we believe that what is in the, the December 31 text does, uh, does, uh, does exactly that. On your larger point, and I tried to get to it in, in, my, in my remarks, you know, when I was asked to do this and I accepted it, uh, a lot of people seem surprised. And they seem surprised back in New York or Washington, but also even in London. And everyone said to a person, I thought this was resolved. 
then you have the, the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement in 1998. And what I believe that highlights, and you got, it, uh, you got at it in your opening statement, there's a difference between, if you will, ending a war and building a peace. And any society coming out of something like three decades of troubles, and uh, Mr. Rohrbacher talked about the civil war in this country, any society like that is traumatized for obvious reasons. It's traumatized psychologically, physically, economically, and, and politically. There's all sorts of divisions, wounds, damage, and the like. And obviously, North Korea, uh, North, Northern Ireland, I apologize. Uh, Northern Ireland was, was no exception. And one day, North Korea will be no exception. Uh, when I, I look forward to that day happening, when it gets out from under uh, the, the rule that, that, and the division uh, it, it has known. And so what, what, this, what this showed to me is that even though Northern Ireland had emerged from the troubles and most of the violence had, had stopped, it had not become anything remotely like a, a normal society. If you walk down parts of Belfast, you are still confronted by concrete barriers separating communities. Upwards of what, 90% of the young people still live in, still go to divided you know, schools, single tradition schools. Neighborhoods are still divided. I don't see the society sowing the seeds of its own normalization, of its own unity, if neighborhoods and schools are, are still divided. And what worries me in that kind of an environment, particularly where politics are not shown to be making progress, alienation will continue to fester, and violence, I fear, could very well uh, reemerge as a characteristic of daily life. Uh, so it's, it's premature to put Northern Ireland, as much as we'd like to, into the outbox of, uh, of problems solved. I'd love for it to be there, and I look forward to that day, but quite honestly, it is not there, it is not there yet. I thank you for that. <clears throat> I hope that that's a message that <clears throat> lawmakers and others will convey, especially at the end of the week, uh, when so many people will make their way uh, from Ireland, Republic of, and Northern Ireland as part of the St. Patrick's Day um, festivities, because again, I think there's a superficial understanding about uh, all, all done, as you put, it's, it's, uh, it's finished, uh, time to move on. Uh, and we need, again, to uh, redouble our efforts, again, to take your blueprint uh, and let people know that there's much more that needs to be done. Uh, let me just ask you uh, if you would like to respond to it. You know, the Finucan case, uh, the horrible, horrific murder of uh, Patrick Finucan, uh, his wife who was here, Geraldine who was wounded, the family was all there. Uh, and they have, on several occasions, testified for our subcommittee uh, to an in, a, in an appeal uh, to the British government, different prime ministers, uh, to finally do what they promised to do, uh, and that is uh, implement a, a or, or create and implement a, um, a public inquiry. Judge Corey sat where you sat, Ambassador Haas, and he couldn't have been more emphatic. Uh, he spoke for the better part of an hour. Uh, and he kept getting back to the unfinished business of, of the Finucane murder uh, and the collusion that was inherent in it. Um, would you want to speak to that? I mean, this, this is like one festering sore. I absolutely am in awe of the courage and the tenacity of Geraldine and her, and her family uh, in carrying on this, this call uh, for an accountability. Would you want to respond to it? Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, no, one has to be uh, impressed by the the courage uh, of the of the Finucane family and and by what you know, by what they've had to uh, endure. Uh, the report deals with the question of increase, but essentially leaves it to the British government to make a decision as to whether it is uh, or believes that is the best way to deal with the as you describe it unfinished uh, business. Uh, the bulk of the report is on other mechanisms for dealing with uh, all sorts of either situations that have never been investigated. Still, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, murders that have, and deaths that have never been uh, investigated. And in many cases where they have been investigated by whatever mechanism, there's multiple mechanisms, as you know, for, for, for investigating them, people are not satisfied with the results. And we also create a, a mechanism on a, where there's reason to do so for reopening. Uh, certain things. So you know, that's, that's essentially the, the approach. But th that will have to be a decision by the, the British government, whether they believe th uh, that it is worth, uh, from their point of view, um, going down the, the path of, of another inquiry. Okay. But having promised it, 
It's just we're looking for promise fulfilled. Let me ask two final questions. Uh, uh, Nula alone made a very strong point in both her oral and written testimony about the legacy unit. Uh, it seems to me that when you have former special branch officers in charge of what is allowed out and, and you know, revealed versus what is not, uh, that is without some kind of oversight that is very real. Uh, that is an engraved invitation, it would seem to me, to just continue hiding uh, a truth that may not be very uh, pretty. And secondly, with regards to the military reaction force, uh, we have, one, as one of our witnesses, Eugene Devlin, who was shot, um, and he, as he says in his testimony, Daniel Rooney, age 18, like himself, was, was killed by a bullet, and, and the information now that is becoming much more visible about this military reaction force. Um, um, your thoughts on that? Well, again, that is why there are two new mechanisms that this report recommends. One is a historical investigations unit, which would look at things, if you will, through the, a legal lens. And then there is a separate information unit that would be created to encourage people to come forth. Because it, as it turns out, there are a number of survivors and victims whose priority, if you will, is not necessarily a, in the legal realm, quote unquote, justice or, retro, or punishment, but rather their, their priority is to, is to simply find out what happened, to, to get the facts about what happened to a loved one. And there are certain uh, incentives put forward in order to encourage individuals, organizations, and governments to cooperate with this information uh, pathway. Now, at the same time, there is nothing in the information pathway that, that provides amnesty. It simply provides what we would call limited immunity, so information introduced there cannot be used for prosecution. But if other information is somehow uh, gained through other means uh, and that warrants prosecution, prosecution could could still happen. And I think it is important that governments, whether it is the British government or, or the Irish government, uh, are involved in this process fully. And I believe that, obviously, paramilitary organizations need to be involved uh, in, this, in this process fully. Uh, paramilitary or organizations across the board, in no small part because the bulk of the violence was done at the hands of paramilitaries. But governments do have special obligations under European law. And obviously, uh, I believe that the British government needs to be a, a participant in, in, in dealing with the past. Can I say one other thing about it? Because it gets at sure. Mr. Rohrbacher's comments. Uh, the point of view he talked about, and I think the analogy he used was the scab, you know, and there is an entire point of view uh, that echoes what he says. And it is the idea that um, in order to deal with the future, you have to let go of the past. There's, there, there is that. So, and public figures, and private figures in Northern Ireland do articulate that. Uh, on the other hand, I came away persuaded that it, it wouldn't work in this case, that you would never get to the point of healing. In a sense, to use his analogy, and analogies are always dangerous, but I'll use it, you would never form the scab without a process. You would never get to the point of healing. And that you needed a process. And, that, and I, I came to this, by the way, after some of the most emotional meetings in my career which was meeting with the victims and survivors and meeting with the families. And no, you can't emerge from these meetings and not be uh, powerfully affected by it. And when I met with these individuals, and I met more broadly with people in, in Northern Ireland, uh, I came away persuaded that you needed a process <clears throat> that would deal with the past. We have talked about two. We have talked about a legal dimension. We have talked about also an information availability dimension. There are other aspects as well. Uh, I think this society doesn't teach the past well. We need ways, we need a curriculum that deals better with it. We need a museum. Why wouldn't there be somewhere a museum dedicated to the troubles? Not that you try to come to a common narrative. I, for one, believe that's uh, unrealistic at this point, given how divided the society is. But why couldn't you have a place where competing, and, where competing narratives are allowed, where people understand the facts, here's the timeline, here's the facts, and people can put forward different narratives? But I think, I, I do believe this is a society that will not be able to get beyond what it's gone through unless there is something of a, uh, of a political but also psychological process of, of contending with it. Otherwise, not, what will happen is different communities will live with their own versions of the past. And I, and I came away thinking that there would never be the kind of bridge building or normalization we and they want to see 
without a multidimensional uh, approach to, to dealing with what happened. Mr. Keating. Thank you very much.